If you'll just join me in a brief moment of prayer, we will go right into the class. This actually is a prayer taken from uh, Ted Loder's book, Gorillas of Grace. And it is titled, I Need to Breathe Deeply, and it seems appropriate for these days. Eternal friend, grant me an ease to breathe deeply of this moment, this light, this miracle of now. Beneath the din and fury of great movements and harsh news and urgent crises, make me attentive still to good news, to small occasions, and the grace of what is possible for me to be, to do, to give, to receive, that I may miss neither my neighbor's gift nor my enemy's need. Good and gracious God, help us all breathe deeply in these difficult days, finding your grace, your peace, your love, as we search for ways to come back together, mending rifts and rebuilding community, even as we maintain safe distances. We ask all this in Christ's name, amen. Oh man, thank you, Allison. And uh, if you can make, jot yourself a note to send me that prayer, I'd love to have it. It's wonderful. I will. I will. So uh, we all come with different uh, hopes uh, for this class, and uh, we will have a breakout session later in the hour together. So you'll have groups of three to be able to, uh, uh, you know, share like two-minute stories about uh, what has been your greatest. Uh, struggle or your greatest joy in prayer. Um, and uh, one thing I like to have happen in the adult education classes is for people to go away having made made a new friend or uh, deepened an old friend relationship. So so basically the the most profound thing you'll learn in these four weeks is that we learn to pray by praying. And everybody has a different style to your prayers. And uh, if you're like me, we evolve into in different seasons of our lives also in being helped by one help or another or finding uh, to remember that the greatest help is the, pr the promise of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. He says, uh, uh, when we pray, we, we don't know what to pray or how to pray, but the Spirit prays through us with groans deeper than words. That's Romans 8, 26, uh, if, you wanna, if you're jotting any notes down. Um, so we have help in our prayers, invisible, but we look for other helps that we can add to on the way. So. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus started his Sermon on the Mount with, first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, poor in spirit unpacks in a lot of different ways, but at least it means that we come to God with a cry for help. When we are before Almighty God, you know, there's a, a, a genuine humility that happens, and prayer increases that joy and the humility at the same time. So I want us to take about uh, four minutes just to uh, relax and uh, listen to this, one of the favorite hymns, sung, this one sung by... Uh, Ortega, Berta Ortega. So, see if we can get into, into it as we start. Oh, by the way, Allison, we need, we need to share a screen first, I think. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that. That's all right. There we go. There you go. I need every hour 
So um, we come to prayer as a cry of the heart, sometimes in desperation, like Peter sinking beneath the waves when he tried to walk on water toward Jesus, Matthew chapter 14. Sometimes we come not so much in desperation as uh, looking for inspiration, like Jesus praying all night on the mountain to connect with his heavenly father and to figure out in his humanity what was the next step. And so we need that as well, to reassess our lives in prayer. And so we come expecting inspiration. We need a, a word outside of ourselves, a word outside of our, our own lives to nudge us in one direction or another. So sometimes we come just for a pure devotion. We feel rightly that we, we owe God our devotion. And so some of you have a, a habit of uh, what I've over the years called a quiet time to give God uh, the best of our day, uh, even get up early before the day begins so that we can uh, give God our best a, devotion 
and the only agenda really is praise sometimes. Sometimes we, we try to pray for uh, guidance. We have two roads diverge and uh, we don't know which fork to take. So we need discernment. We need uh, to decide rightly. We need wisdom. And we hope that the Holy Spirit will uh, come through the open door that prayer offers. Sometimes we, uh, we mourn and are in a very sad place, place of loss. We might think of Jesus weeping at the tomb of his best friend, Lazarus. Jesus wept. So however we, we come to prayer, uh, this is the place where we rightly want to draw close to God and find ways of uh, finding inspiration or devotion, hope in our desperation, um, guidance in our confusion, comfort in our mourning and grieving. So this book, The Meaning of Prayer, uh, believe it or not, I discovered way back in my first days at Fourth Church. Harry Emerson Fosdick, um, I mean, it was written 100 years ago, during World War I. And if you can imagine, because he was a, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was the founding pastor of Riverside Church in New York City. He, um, he, he was a, a, ma a man of preacher with a, a great uh, social conscience. But he doesn't mention a thing about World War I in his book, uh, The Meaning of Prayer. Oddly enough, when you think of the context. So th this classic book uh, is formatted uh, in a great way. It's very user-friendly. Every day of the 10-day cycle, um, there's a scripture. And it's so interesting, the scriptures he uses. Uh, they, he usually takes me in the place, the scripture place, uh, of a place that I would never have thought of going in the particular topic he's dealing with for that week. But he, he has a scripture, and then he has his own uh, reflections on that scripture. That's the second part of the three-part daily rhythm as he uh, makes a commentary on the struggles and the satisfactions of praying. And then there's a classic prayer from one of the great voices of the history of Christianity. And um, though the voices will come with a, a different vernacular, you know, because they come from a different age, uh, from Augustine's through uh, somewhat of, a, of the 20th century. Um, it's almost good to, and I'm going to read a prayer in a moment, uh, one of those prayers, slowly to you, and uh, kind of treat the prayers that you read. You have to kind of read them, and not to get a prayer done and get it over with, um, or get the, uh, or just stick in the uh, uh, the left side of the brain with the the cognitive rational, but you want to go to the right side of the brain too and read the prayer that way so that we can get the affective inspiration of these prayers, these classic prayers, as well as the, uh, the theology of it. So the way we're going to handle these four weeks, uh, first of all, today, we're going to look at the, the universal longing to pray. And this is Fosdick's chapters one and two. He talks about the naturalness of prayer. Prayer comes out of the heart. It's part of the image of God calling out to, to be united with that image. Um, uh, you know, I always remember, uh, I, I do quite a bit of uh, relating of my spiritual autobiography, which I will not do today, but but in small groups of men that I've gathered together, and uh, I have one now that is, is uh, just getting off the launching pad. We have one week, everyone tells his spiritual autobiography in 20 minutes, which is difficult. But I always uh, go back, I often go back, I tell it a different way each time I tell it, but go back to a, 
time when I was eight years old, and I didn't know any of the Bible, much of the Bible at all. Uh, I didn't know any theology, but we were, I was sitting on the beach next to my father, Hollywood Beach, Florida. My brother was on my other side, my older brother. My dad looked up at the moon rising over the Atlantic Ocean. He kind of let out a gasp, and he said, he shook his head and said, how can anybody see this beauty, this beauty, and uh, not believe that there's a God? And something registered to me. He was not a pastor, by the way. He was a salesman. Did a kind of a 70-mile circuit around little Laporte, Indiana, my hometown. Uh, but something about that uh, registered. I looked at the moon in a different way. I looked at the stars. Wow. That's true. So there's a universal longing there uh, to pray, to connect with that uh, creator. The wonder of creation. So we'll look at that today. Uh, and then uh, next week, we're going to go into knowing to whom we are praying. This is handled by Fosdick in chapters three and four. Um, and we'll, we'll have a, a biblical text for each one of these weeks. And our biblical text for next week uh, will be um, from Romans 7 and 8. 7 is Paul's great struggle of the soul, and 8 is his... Uh, is talking about the Holy Spirit. And so the apostle writes, you know, when we cry, Abba, which is Aramaic for Father. You may remember what prayer you heard Abba someplace else in the New Testament. It was Jesus in Gethsemane. Mark reports that his prayer was Abba, Abba, Father. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, inclusive language and uh, the, the image of God being male and female. It comes right from the first chapter of the Bible. Uh, but when we cry, Paul says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, that we belong to God. Something in us is saying yes to the good news. So it helps to know who we're praying for. Um, and then, uh, you know, let me, let me advance, uh, or Allison, if you could advance to the eighth slide, uh, we've had a wonderful opening prayer already, but I just want to give you an example of one of these prayers in, uh, let's see if I can move my little screen to the side there. Uh, one of these prayers that's in the book, Meaning of Prayer. So if you'd bow with me again, and I'm going to read it very slowly, just as I recommended that you read these prayers slowly. And uh, maybe you could even have an image that uh, with each pause, you are conscious of a door, opening a door for the Holy Spirit to make connections and um Part of my journaling actually is when I have a scripture that I read slowly, or if I have a prayer that I read slowly, uh, each pause, uh, often there's a picture that comes into mind. And so um, I write that down because I'm trying to be attentive to how the spirit may be calling me, teaching me, guiding me giving me hope in desperation, giving me comfort in grieving. So let us pray. George Matheson, by the way, uh, this is relevant. George Matheson was a Scottish preacher and hymn writer. Uh, if you look at the hymns, once we get back to church together, let's have the confidence that that will happen at the right time. But you'll see George Matheson's name on some of the hymns that are our favorites. So he was a Scottish uh, hymn writer and preacher. 
lived a, born in Glasgow, lived in Edinburgh the rest of his life. And he was blind. He was blind from his use. So he was the blind preacher. O thou divine spirit, that in all the events of life are knocking at the door of my heart, help me to respond to thee. I would not be driven blindly as the stars over their courses. I would not be made to work out thy will unwillingly, to fill, fulfill thy law unintelligently, to obey thy mandates unsympathetically, I would take the events of my life as good and perfect gifts from thee. I would have my heart open at all times to receive that morning, noon, and night, in spring and summer and winter, whether thou comest to me in sunshine or in rain, I would take thee into my heart joyfully. Thou art thyself more than the sunshine. Thou art thyself compensation for the rain. It is thee and not thy gifts I crave. Knock and I shall open unto thee. Amen. You can take us back to the next slide. I think it's three or four now. Um, yeah, back to three. Um, I think maybe I'm through with that, but I would just want to double check. So that's uh, next week, knowing to whom we are praying. Uh, yeah. Fosdick, chapters three and four. Okay, you can advance that now, Allison, to the next slide. And then the 29th, we deal with hindrances and difficulties. This is, in a way, the most important week, and I apologize, it has fallen on Thanksgiving weekend. So maybe you're all going to have family or be with family at that time. But uh, anyway, this is a, it's a good section of the Fosdick's book, <clears throat> chapters five through seven. And the hindrances and difficulties that we run into as we try to pray, uh, the, the first is ourselves. And we'll go a little more deeply into Paul's struggle. I do not understand my own actions. The good that I... I want to do, I cannot do, and the evil that I do not want to do is exactly what I do. Wretched man that I am, he cries out in uh, a wonderful moment of transparency that he gives to us. Uh, and then, then there's this, uh, so our, ourselves uh, are one hindrance. Um, but there's this in, in the Gospels that may have mystified you, or it's very off-putting, uh, to some, that the devil keeps showing up, the demons keep showing up, the strange, persistent presence of the devil in the Gospels, competing with Jesus for people's allegiance. Well, this has a, an important place in our faith. Uh, we could call it spiritual warfare, because prayer can be a struggle, and here we have some examples of that. Uh, for example, you come to uh, to pray for somebody else, or uh, you have a troubling relationship and you're filled with these judgmental thoughts. Um, and uh, you just can't get them out of your mind. I mean, uh, so we have judgmental thoughts toward people. And then uh, perhaps you need to move quickly to confession. But anyway, uh, sometimes you just need to go on and put that in the hands of the forgiving Lord. Um, so one hindrance is judgmental thoughts. Uh, then we have the wandering mind. Tasks come to mind immediately. 
Uh, we think of, oh, you know, if I just had this quick win, I could go to the kitchen, I can write down a phone number, and I can get back to my uh, my quiet time. And uh, of course, you never get back first four o'clock in the afternoon, and you never got to it. But the wandering mind, while we try to pray, um, on the on the fourth week, the last week, we're going to deal with uh, some ways to um, to deal with that. Um, and then we have uh, the discouragements of unanswered prayer. Fosdick has a whole chapter on unanswered prayer. And then we have the thing that we we are, are, are could we be tongue-tied before the Lord? We, we finally sit down, we, we do our best to have a set aside a time, and we just don't have the words. Or we find ourselves repeating the same words. I mean, how, how much more can you say than, God, thank you? And oftentimes, there's not, not any more you need to say, but uh, we'd like to be able to uh, move through by thank you. Or uh, help me, God, is another, uh, what I call a, a, a gasp prayer. It's a prayer that comes out like Peter sinking beneath the waves. Help me, Lord as he reaches out. So we'll look at uh, how, to, how to find the, uh, the words. Uh, there have been two things, I have to say, that have rev revolutionized my prayer life. Uh, and by the way, not that I have it together at all, <laughs> uh, but um, these two things have helped a lot. One is journaling. And there was a certain time in my life when I began to write my prayers to God uh, and not come out of a scripture saying, well, God does this, God does that. Um, uh, this means that God is like this. Uh, but, but turn them into a prayer. Let me give you an example for you, uh, just so I can be more specific. I'm turning to uh, Shannon's text for today. She'll be in Matthew chapter 25, talking about the parable of the, the talents. And so it goes like this. I'll shorten it a little bit. Um, this is uh, chapter 25, verse 14. Jesus says, uh, For it's as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and trusted his property to them. To one uh, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to another according to uh, each his own ability. And then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them. And uh, the one who had the two talents made two more as he invested them. But the one who had received just the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid it. So, so what I might do in praying the scripture Two things were journaling and number two, praying the scripture. We'll get into that in the fourth week. What does it mean to pray the scripture? In this case, praying the scripture would be to uh, let the uh, scripture of the day give you the words. And what my words, where my words are going are, uh, Lord, uh, you know, save me from burying my talent. Or it might be, and I'm writing this, okay? I'm writing to God in the journal, prompted by the scripture. The scripture sets the agenda. Uh, or I might ask uh, in my journaling, I might ask, uh, Lord, what are my talents that I'm supposed to invest? What, how would you call that? If I were sitting, sitting with you, can you, and I reflect on what, you know, unique um, opportunities be it uh, position, influence, financial um, uh, relationships, whatever they are, uh, platforms, um, that um, the Holy Spirit might inform me are coming to light as I reflect. So praying the scripture really helps. Uh, it gives words to our prayers, and I, we write them down. And you'll notice, those of you who journal have experienced this, but as you write... Sometimes the, the writing takes a life of its own. 
and um, you find yourself thinking thoughts you never knew you knew or discovering things you never thought you would in that time. So in the last week together, we'll talk about journaling, we'll talk about praying the scriptures, we'll talk about praying for others, necessary prayer. Fazek has a whole chapter on that. It's called Unselfishness in Prayer, his last chapter, I think. Uh, we have uh, praying with others, group prayer is another method of praying, um, or using a prayer book to jumpstart your prayers. And you may uh, shrug this off and say, well, you know, I, I don't like canned prayers. Well, they're not canned prayers. They're prayers that people uh, over the years have put together as they have entered into prayer. The Holy Spirit has been with them, but they're not meant to be an end as so much as a beginning. So it's a jumpstart to our prayers. One I mentioned here would be worth ordering. I guess another classic by John Bailey. I guess I like Scots, but I think Bailey was also a Scotsman. A Diary of Private Prayer. Some of you I know have discovered that long ago. A Diary of Private Prayer. It's not about prayer. It's just 31 prayers, morning and evening, uh, one for each day. Okay, um, so today we can move to uh, the slide to Allison about the universal longing to pray. Fosdick starts out with the naturalness of prayer, with the um, prayer as communion with God, drawing close to God, fellowship with God, very personal. And there are helps along the way <clears throat> that express this universal longing. We have songs that help. Uh, let me uh, the Psalms are all songs, I guess you know. So I turn to Psalm 19. That's the one that starts. The many great musical works have been done on this psalm. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And the firmament proclaims God's handwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There really is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So psalms help. Songs help. Um, this experience I had, I described my father back on the, back to the, Hollywood Beach in Florida, as I sat next to my father as the moon rose out of the Atlantic Ocean. I didn't know this psalm until years later, and I memorized it, I think, when I was in a seminary. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how awesome is your in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the moon and the stars, which you have established, what is humanity? What are human beings that we are mindful, that you are mindful of us? So again, the cry of the heart uh, is, is a universal longing. Um, suffering, of course, prompts prayer. And uh, inspiration from others often prompts prayer. So what we're going to do now is to do some breakout groups, uh, three per group, roughly. We might have four in one or another. And uh, Allison is going to put us into uh, breakout groups. And I'd like you to do two things in those breakout groups. In fact, if you uh, wouldn't mind, uh, uh, can, yeah, there we go. So the great breakout groups, you have two and a half minutes each. This, these would be eight minutes, uh, so we don't run out of time. And... Um, in uh, one of the, use one of those minutes just to give your name and maybe where you grew up, what you do during the week. You don't have to answer all these, but you might choose one or two to answer. How did you happen to find Fourth Church? What are you hoping to find at Fourth Church? And then use the other minute and a half to, uh, and not everybody has to speak, by the way, because you might draw, draw a blank on this, but what is your greatest joy or struggle 
when it comes to prayer and maybe share a joy or a struggle when it comes to prayer. And then what are your hopes for getting out of this class? Okay. So go for eight minutes and we'll see you back when you come back. We're regathering. That's good. Thank you, Allison. Well done. So, um, yeah, we can go to that next slide is good. Uh, I hope you had good conversations. We're not going to have plenary feedback at this time just because there's not the time for it, but I hope you've uh, uh, learned something new about each other. I certainly did about my two partners. So, um, but when in the very first chapter on the universal, the naturalness of prayer, Fosdick brings up this uh, prayer that's uh, almost never preached on and uh, not often heard from Solomon's dedication of the temple. <laughs> and let me read that to you uh, because it's quite amazing. You know, we had uh, here the chosen people. They saw themselves, uh, you know, rightly as God chosen. Um, the seeming exclusivity of that uh, is off-putting to many of us. But nevertheless, God had to start somewhere, right, uh, in the revelation that would come from the Jews. Uh, one of my favorite books is uh, by uh, uh, called The Gifts of the Jews, and just the uniqueness of uh, this uh, small group of people when it comes to the whole populace of the world. But anyway, so Solomon prays to dedicate the temple back in almost 1000 B.C., Likewise, when foreigners who are not of your people, Israel, come from the distant land because of your name, O God, and your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this house, may these foreigners hear from heaven. As they pray in your dwelling place. And do whatever the foreigners ask of you, in order that all the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel. And that they may know that you have been invoked on, that prayer has been invoked on this house that I have built. Well, uh, the promise of the Hebrew scriptures is always that they would be a light to the nations. And that's why uh, Jesus, the last thing that Matthew quotes Jesus in, is so significant uh, when Jesus gives what we think of as often called the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded. And I will be with you always. So it was always meant to be a light to the nations. And then we come to the Apostle Paul. This is on his, uh, his uh, second missionary journey in Acts 17. And he has this same broad view. I mean, uh, you know, Paul was a, he was surprised by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Do you remember that? As a Pharisee. His cause was to stamp out this Christian movement, which was dangerous and bad news. And then Jesus surprised him on the road, and he became blinded in a flash of light. This is Acts chapter 9. And uh, he heard the voice from above saying, Saul, Saul, Paul's Hebrew name, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Said Paul. And the word came back, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, he became a passionate apostle of the good news of Jesus. But he ends up in Athens, the center of the intelligentsia of the world at that time, first century. And uh, this is a very interesting passage, I think, Acts chapter 17. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus. Some of you have been there, I'm sure, the Areopagus in Athens. 
that was where these uh, the intelligentsia gathered to have debates. And Paul said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among you an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this is the one I proclaim to you. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have uh, jud judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Uh, he's talking about Jesus, of course. Well, that provoked great pushback by the Athenians, especially as being raised from the dead part. And the rest of Acts kind of tells the tale of how that, that uh, went on. But here to an unknown God. So, so again, this, this large vision of the universality of prayer, the universality <coughs> of people of all faiths trying to reach outside of their own little worlds to find the source of their life, the source of the universe, uh, this is a universal longing, to be sure. We're at the end of our time, but it kind of points the way to next week uh, on knowing Dave, you're muted. You're, you've gotten muted somehow. I'm sorry, was I muted all that time? No, just in the last Okay, minute. so you, you, you heard Paul, right? Mm -hmm. You heard Paul speak from Acts 17. Uh, yeah. no, no matter, you have it there. So uh, what I'm saying is that we are out of time, but we need to be pointed out to next week. And we'll be talking about the... Um, the hindrances of uh, no, knowing to whom we pray. And that's Fosdick chapters three and four. And we'll be looking at the Lord's Prayer next week. We want to advance to the next, uh, let's see, I think we're going to from here to, to conclude. Yes, thank you. So uh, this is another prayer uh, by Henry Ward Beecher. Um, 1870. He was based in Boston, has quite a, a flamboyant history, I have to say, but uh, he certainly knew how to pray. So if you could back that up, I divided this between two slides, and we'll go with the slide before and this slide back again. Thank you. So pray with me as we depart. We rejoice, O oh God, that in all time, men and women have found a refuge in thee, that prayer is the voice of pleading, the voice of thanksgiving. Our souls overflow toward thee as a cup when full. And we cannot forbear, nor can we search to see if our prayers have been registered or whether of the things we ask, we received much or more or anything, but that we have permission to feel ourselves in thy presence, to take from thee uh, for ourselves something of the light of thy countenance, to have a consciousness that thy thoughts 
and our experience of your inspiration it comes from your Holy Spirit in any measure. This is an answer to prayer transcending all that we can think of. We are glad that we can glorify thee, that we can rejoice in thee. There we go. We rejoice. We rejoice that in all time, men and women have found a refuge in thee. That prayer is the voice of love, the voice of pleading, the voice of thanksgiving. Our souls overflow toward thee as a cup when full. I'm fast forwarding down to the end of the prayer. And we are glad that we can glorify thee, that we can rejoice in thee, that it does make a difference to thee what we do, and that thou dost enfold us in a consciousness of thy sympathy with us, of how much thou art to us and what we are to thee. Amen. Well, go with God, and we'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, uh, as, as you have uh, had certain uh, discussion in your small groups that um, uh, your, your greatest joys, struggles, uh, if you think about it and feel so led, uh, write me, because we didn't have time for a you know, plenary feedback from the whole group. But I would like to know some of the things that you might have been thinking of. So you don't all have to do that. That's not an assignment, but uh, I'd like to hear from you. I'm easy to find, by the way. I'm like all the other staff members. Uh, D, first initial, last name, D Handley at fourthchurch.org. Thank you. God bless you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Goodbye, Thanks, everyone. Allison. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Allison. Thanks. Good to see you, Polly. You too. Take care. <laughs>